If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to 1 Peter. We're in chapter 3 this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 22. And I'd like to read this portion. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame." For it is better, if God should will it, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also He went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who were once disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to Him. There's a story that's told about an ant. It was an ant that felt, not an ant like Aunt Bess or whatever, but an ant. And this ant felt very imposed upon and overburdened and overworked. You see, he was instructed to carry a piece of straw across an expanse of concrete. The straw that he carried, this piece, was long and it was very heavy. And it's, he staggered beneath the weight of this, this uh, burden. Finally, as the stress of the burden uh, began to overwhelm him and he just he, he wondered if it was even worth it, if life itself was worth carrying it. He comes to a halt at a very large crack in the path. There's no way uh, of getting across this deep chasm. He can't, he can't get across it at all. And so he, he's in despair here and, he, and there wasn't anything he could do and he felt like this crack was going to be his final undoing. But then in the midst of his discouragement, a thought struck him. And the thought was, I'll lay this piece of straw across this crack and cross. And he did that. What happened was, is that heavy load had become a helpful bridge to this end. The burden proved ultimately to be a great blessing for this end. Likewise, for us, oftentimes we feel imposed upon by God, burdened by the Lord, overburdened, if you will, because we're called upon to endure suffering or be persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And the problem is, is we fail. We fail to see the reality of the situation as we're going through it. Because we lose sight of, of what it's all about and we only see the hardship. The reality is this, and, and Peter points out this reality in our passage at hand. And what we learn here is this, is to be called to suffer, to be called upon to suffer for the sake of righteousness is in reality to be greatly blessed. If we could only get there, if we could only realize that. But the re that is the reality. In other words, all who suffer, all who endure suffering for righteousness' sake are highly favored of God 
and should endure, endure it, the, the suffering, in a manner that is in keeping with that privilege. Because that's what it is. If we're suffering for righteousness sake. We enter the third cycle here in the book of uh, 1 Peter 3.13 here, and it'll run through 5.11. This third cycle of exhortations and suffering now becomes the focus. We, he, he specifically starts really targeting in on the circumstances that these believers that he writes to find themselves in. He's hinted at it all the way along. But he's been telling them who they are, the privileges of that, and, 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 and trying to help them to embrace that in a practical way, how that should impact that. But now he's going to talk to them specifically about the suffering. But in verses 13 and 14, we notice this. Look, look at the verses again. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. Peter here, he states that, I mean those verses state the proposition that I've already shared with you. The theme of this, this, this portion from 13 through 22. He states it very clearly here as he, he sets this forth. Even though, he says, it is unusual to suffer for doing what is good. It's an unusual thing. It's a, a rhetorical question he asks there. But even though uh, they can't harm us in any real way, damage us, suffering for the sake of righteousness does happen. It does happen. You can do all the right things for all the right reasons and you can be persecuted for it. You can suffer for it. And he makes us aware of that. But we need, the call is, is to endure it as though we are experiencing a great blessing. That this is a blessing if you find yourself in a context where you're suffering for the sake of righteousness. If you're enduring persecution because of your love and your life for Jesus Christ, you're blessed. That's what we're told here. And that is a powerful, powerful truth. Not only powerful in what it states, but how it empowers the person going through the suffering. If we understand that. If we can really grab hold of that. The problem is, is we have a hard time discerning whether I'm suffering for righteousness sake or suffering for being an idiot. And there's the problem. But, but there is a difference. And you know when you're doing the right. And it's at those moments where you feel the least, I mean, you, you feel the burden of the unfairness of it. This isn't right, but isn't it? Isn't it? Because we're told here that if I have to go through that for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of righteousness, I'm greatly blessed. I'm greatly blessed of God to have, have been given that privilege here. Now the question is, is how do we continue through this? Because we're told here that we're to go through that suffering. It's, it, we're told without fear of intimidation or being troubled or confusion, without fear or confusion in the moment. And I'm, I'm going to say this right at the outset here. I really think that this is what defines the believer, and, 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 and I don't want to say only the mature believer, because I've seen young believers exemplify great maturity. So I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about spirituality. How we go through it when unjustly treated speaks highly of, of where we're at in, in our walk with the Lord. If we can embrace it as a blessing, as a privilege, then, then you're exemplifying true maturity in Christ. You're, you're living as you should be in the moment. Because the opposite is fear and confusion. And he says, don't let that be the case. That should not be the case. 
The great question though is this, how do we continue without the fear in the midst of the suffering? How do we get through it without being intimidated, without being confused, and, and, and manifesting that as we're going through the moment? Well, Peter, he, he, he does a really good job of pointing out in this particular passage as he drives home this truth, three keys. Three keys to coming through suffering in a proper manner. If we want to go through it in a right way, these keys need to be something that we have in mind, that we have, we have implemented as we go through it. I'm just going to state them and then, then we'll go back and look at each one. First, we need to personally enthrone Christ as Lord in our life. We need to personally enthrone Christ as Lord, verse 15. Second, we need to keep a pure conscience in verses 16 through 17. And then third, we need to remember the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. That should come to our mind. That should be the foremost example, model that we, we, we try to emulate. Verses 18 through 22. So let's look now at, at the first key to coming through the suffering in a manner that, that, that speaks of, of being Christian, solid believers. Not with intimidation, fear, and confusion. First key was we need to personally enthrone Christ as Lord. Look at the verse again, verse 15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Christians are to sanctify, what it says here, sanctify Christ as Lord in their hearts. In the context of what? Suffering. That's the context. He's talking about how to suffer. How do you go through it without fear and intimidation? It starts by enthroning Christ as Lord in my heart. Sanctifying Christ as Lord in my heart. Now let's talk about this sanctify. In your hearts Christ is Lord. There's two, three, excuse me, three points that I want to touch on in, in, in that idea. First, the idea of sanctify. This is not purify Christ. It's not make holy Christ. What it is, is it, it's idea to treat as holy. We're told to take an action as regards Christ here. In the context of of suffering. I believe all of life for that matter, but especially when you're going through suffering, if you want to come through it in a right way. If you really want to have an impact as you go through it. It starts by sanctifying Christ. To treat as holy. To set apart Christ. What's the idea? What's he really saying? He's saying enshrine as the object of preeminence and reverence the Lord in our heart. So what's he saying? He's saying no matter what I go through or how bad it could possibly get, the foremost and most important thing is Jesus Christ. See how that would change everything? How it, it doesn't matter what you're going through if it's all about Him. And I'm going to tell you something. Oftentimes because of our sinfulness and our own flesh and our own pride, in ourselves, that we think we're so special, we think He's selfish to want all that glory. But I'm going to tell you something. If you really realize the pit of hell that you were delivered out of by the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God, all it is about is Christ. That's what it should matter. That's all that should matter. Is Jesus. And especially when I'm going through it and I'm called upon to suffer. For Him. Man, if you make it about you, you're going to crash and burn. You're going down in smoke and flames. You are. You're going to fail miserably. Because if you're suffering for righteousness sake, you're suffering for Jesus Christ. So you, you, have to, you have to turn this and understand that. And He tells us we have to start by sanctifying 
Christ as Lord, enshrining Him, giving Him the place of preeminence in my heart. And that's what he says, in our heart. What's he mean by in our hearts? We know what the the heart means in Scripture. The heart is who you are. That's how Scripture looks at the heart. Christ doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks at what? Who you are. He looks at the heart of the man. That's what's beautiful. Not the physical. We had an example of that not too long ago. Sarah is a knockout. But he wasn't even talking to her about it. He's he's telling women, don't adorn your bodies and your faces and dresses and clothing and all this. Adorn the heart. And he uses a knockout, by the way, to make the case. Because he wasn't looking at her beauty. He was looking at what? Her heart. He was looking at her heart. And he's saying... To us, as we face suffering, you sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. What's he saying? In the core of you ought to sit on the throne Jesus. He ought to be set apart. And I'm going to tell you, I I don't know how to say this, but I know it for a certainty. I've been there. You can't be a pastor, and I'm not blowing, you can't be a Christian for that matter. For 30 years, with a walk where you tried to love the Lord and not have suffered for righteousness sake at some point. And I'm going to tell you, if the Lord isn't on the throne and it's not about Him, you're not going to go through it in a way that's glorifying, in a proper way. You're just not. It's, it, it's impossible. Because it becomes about me and the injustice, and not about shining for Jesus in the moment. So we got to sanctify Him. And then he says this enthronement in our heart, this enthroning, it comes from the phrase, as Lord. As Lord. I want to tell you something. The idea here is taking Christ and making Him the Master. The one who, who literally... Uh, who, who it's, it's, it's all about who directs my path. His Lordship is what I follow. So if I find, here's the point of this, if I find myself in the context of suffering, and I'm His, did He cease to be Lord? No. So what am I, what's my responsibility? To embrace the moment, whatever it is, as his servant, and he as my Lord. So if he's put me here, I can't bail out on him. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. Now I want to say something about this Lord thing. We dethrone him. We can dethrone him. But you can't stop him from being Lord. He is the Lord. He is the Lord. But individually, we can diminish that. And what He's saying to us, if we're going to face suffering, then listen, let's sanctify the Lord as Lord in our hearts. Enshrine Him there. And I'm going to tell you, if you can do that, if you do that, and you live like that, and you choose that path, and you're going to do that, when suffering comes, I'm going to tell you something, you're going to go through it for the glory of God. I've seen it. A hundredfold. And I've seen just as many a hundredfold crash and burn because they weren't willing to do that. Because their life, it doesn't happen, folks, in a moment. It's what we do with Him. It's what we do with Him in the moments where there isn't the suffering. Is He Lord then? Because He's Lord all the time. And the Lordship really takes on a great perspective when I'm called upon to suffer for Him. Because now I can see suffering entirely different. It's not about me. It's about the Lord. And I'm privileged and I've been blessed of God, highly favored to be allowed to suffer for Him. You see it? Can you, can you see that? It makes absolute sense to me. 
And that's what we're called to do. That's the first key. This, this, it says here, if we're willing to do this, and this is actually the way the, the, the language unfolds. When we, we enthrone him, there's a result. And if you note the result, it's 15b. And that is, is we'll have a ready apologetic, a defense, a witness, an answer for anyone about the hope we possess. The hope within us that we possess. See, we tend, we've, I've done it. I'm guilty as much as anybody. We use this passage as a, 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 a proof text for the need for every believer to be an apologist for Christianity. But in this context, really what it's telling us is that we, by enthroning Christ as Lord in our hearts, when we're going through the suffering and people look at that and see that you can go through this without intimidation and without confusion and in, in the sphere of hope, you have an answer for that. And what's the answer? Christ is Lord. That's the answer. He's the Lord. And He's on the throne of my life. This isn't some train wreck that happened randomly. This passed by the one who, who is my Lord. And He's called upon me, blessed me with the privilege of suffering for Him. So it's a ready answer. Now, do we need to be able to give an answer? Yeah, we do. We should. You, you, every, every believer, every believer should be a student. And there's a big difference in being a student and just being a believer. You need to study. You need to, you need to be in the Word. You need to be in a context where you're being challenged by the truth of God's Word. Not just, not just taking it in and in and in, but, but learning it. Trying to grow. Processing. Being in a context to, be, to, to, to learn. That's what we should do. All of us should want that. So that we have an apologetic. We should be able to defend our faith. But in this context, what he's talking about is when we enthrone him, you're going to have the, the apologetic. And the apolo it's not that he's going to provide every theological answer for you. But what he's saying is, is if he's sitting upon the throne of their heart and they ask you, how in the world, how in the world can you go through this like this? Because my Lord is Lord. And he's the Lord of my life. And that's your answer. That's your, that, that, that starts the whole process. So it starts with this impersonal enthronement of Christ. And as, as we do that, we're going to meet the suffering uh, as one who's been blessed or, or privileged of God. That's the first key here. Let's go on now. We need to keep moving. And the second key is this. We need to keep a pure conscience. Look at verses 16 and 17. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which they are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. So what's the second key to going through suffering in a right manner? We need to keep a pure conscience, a right Conscience, how it, it's put here, uh, it, it says here, keep a good conscience. The idea is, is a good, a clean, pure conscience. The point is obvious. We need to maintain a personal righteousness in our life, a good conscience in the Lord. A good conscience so that as we are accused, as we are unjustly treated, as we're reviled, as we're slandered, as we're persecuted, as we suffer for righteousness' sake, there's no basis for it. There's no basis for it. And you want to know something? This, this is known throughout church history. It is, not, it is not the overwhelming majority of the times in, in, the, in, in the least point. I mean, what I mean is, is that more often than not, it's very few who notice. 
But they do. When you're suffering unjustly, it's easy for the world to jump on that because they're all unbelievers. Okay? But there are those who know you that know you, your context. The world might, you know, the majority may not know you, but there are those who do know you. And if Christ has been enthroned as Lord in your heart, and you've been living that way with a good conscience, the very things they slander you in, people notice that. And they know it's wrong. They know that that's not the person. Now, will they jump on the bandwagon if they're unbelievers? Absolutely. That's what they do. That's what it tends to happen. But I'm going to tell you, throughout church history, there have been those who don't even know the Lord who have been able to recognize that the persecution and the suffering that's endured by true believers was unmerited. Unmerited. Read church history. It's not the overwhelming majority of the time, but it's there. Just the truth of what's here. It's there. And I believe more so in the context of the world we live in. Where we live our life. I don't expect people in Peoria, if I started suffering unjustly, to be able to sort out whether that's right or wrong. But I I sure hope the people of Delavan, (laughs) unbeliever or believer alike, whom I've lived my life in front of for 30 plus years in the Lord, can see, and a few even maybe not knowing Christ, might be able to say, you know what, that is not the guy I know, nor have seen in my world that I I live in. And that's what he's talking about. They're put to shame. It's a shameful thing for them to accuse you wrongly. And he's telling us, let's make it so. As much as it depends on me or you personally, You suffer for righteousness sake with a good conscience. Not with one that's defiled. And what I mean is, is deservingly, he's already talked about that in in past texts. He's told us that, you know, what good is it? What's, What's the value in suffering when you deserve it? You're acting like a moron. You know, and you get what you you deserve. It it it'd be like this, you know, and, and this is a hot button. But, but, but the reality is, is Christians should be totally against abortion. It's killing. That's the reality. We're taking life. That's what abortion does. It kills. Because God recognizes life at the moment of conception. But we can't go out and shoot people. And then when the law comes and locks you up for murder, cry out, I'm being persecuted for righteousness sake. You see what I'm saying? You have to to be able to to have a good conscience in things. You can be strong. You can go go make your case before the, 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 the legislators and you can stand outside of clinics with signs and you can pray and you can do all of these votes. Vote, people. Vote for what God stands for and quit voting for pocketbooks and what other people are telling you to. Think for yourself. Think for God, for goodness sakes. We need to think for the Lord, what the Lord says in these things. We're in the boat we're in because we don't care about this. We talk the talk on all this stuff, but we vote however it, it suits our fancy. You can't do that. And we can't act out in the same vein. We have to have a good conscience. A clean conscience in these things. So that when they do accuse, which is the nature of the world, the lost, to persecute us, there's no basis. And then then what we are is we're blessed. We're privileged. Isn't that cool to think about that? Because God's allowed it. Because that's exactly what it said here. Let me go back here to the verse. Look at it. For it is better... Now listen to this. If God should what? Will it so? What's that tell me? That that suffering came past the table of the Lord before it ever came to me. And He allowed it in His will to take place in my life. 
so that I might shine for Him in that context. That I might be a witness and have that answer for that hope that, it, that, that He would shine in the moment through my, how I go through that suffering. We got it. We, the, the, the second key is a clean, a good, a pure conscience. You want to suffer right? Then suffer for the right reason. Suffer for Him. Let it be unjustly deserved. That's as it should be for the believer. Now the last key, the final, third key to coming through the suffering in a proper manner as one blessed of God. And that is remember the example of Christ. And I'm going to read it again. Verses 18 through 22. For Christ, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also He went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to Him. Third key was what? The example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have that as your model. Remember Him. When you start whining, when you start making it about you, you, look, you need to look no further than the one you've already enthroned in your heart as one who's endured on a level that you or I can never ever get to unjust suffering. Persecution for righteousness sake. And He's my Lord. And if He suffered so, am I not blessed or privileged of God if He's allowed me to suffer in kind for Him? That's the point that's made here. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm sure some of you are here, oh wow, there's some really controversial verses in here. <laughs> it's going to get good in here. Well, it is and it isn't. I'm going to help you out a little bit but I'm not going to jump in headlong here. This is a very tough text. There's some tough verses in here. But what I just told you is exactly why this portion is here. It's not to teach on the imprisoned, uh, imprisoned spirits. It's not to teach on baptismal regeneration. But there are things said here that, that I would be uh, amiss to not deal with because you'd walk out of here boy he ducked that slick didn't he <laughs> I don't duck much anyway but anyway it's here and so I do want to say a couple things about it there is an issue in this passage centering on two things one is the, pro, the, the pro, proclamation made to imprison spirits by Christ that's one the second one is the statement that says corresponding to that baptism now saves you. So before I, I, I come back to what the actual purpose is, as I've already stated, the intended purpose of the section, I want to briefly consider these issues of debate. Okay, The first one has to do with the proclamation to imprisoned spirits. I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. If you want to talk about this more with me, I'll be willing to do that, with, you know, discuss and look at whatever uh, in the Word with you uh, at some point. But the proclamation to imprison spirits. The question first is, is has to do with the, the spirits imprisoned in verse 19 there. Who are these? In, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Well, he goes on to tell us who they are, but there's two possible views to this that, that, that are here. And, uh, there's 
the other three, but the two that really have merit are these. One is, is that these are the people disobedient during Noah's time. He went and made proclamation to them. Or the second view is, is these are the fallen angels of Noah's time who transgressed their natural state as spoken of in 2 Peter 2 and Jude 6. Some of you have been through that. If you're going to high school, uh, college age students are going through the class with Mark. You guys went through and where you looked at, at, at this. The, 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 my take is it's the latter. It's the fallen angels and that seems to be exactly the context of, of what we have here. They were those spirits who were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting uh, in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So who are these spirits? What they did in Genesis 6 was so horrendous to God that He intervened because of the wickedness of man embracing being motivated by these fallen Spirits, these fallen angels, it was so offensive to God that He destroyed the earth. He flooded the earth with a universal flood and only eight people, by the way, were rescued by the flood. See, we tend to go to the negative and we say, oh, you know, He destroyed, He destroyed. Well, yeah, it was a universal flood. But what the Scriptures teach, it was a rescue operation for eight righteous. He rescued them out of the wickedness that had permeated. And these, these fallen angels were culprits. They were big players in it. They inter involved themselves in the dealings of man and it seems in an immoral capacity and I don't want to go into all the details there but in, a, in a, an immoral way I believe through demon possession and ultimately moved humanity into a wickedness that was devoid of God to where there was few to even rescue in the, in the time and these are the ones that are in prison. The proclamation. Now, in the same vein, what's that about? This proclamation. Well, is it the preaching of the gospel? Did he go to the fallen and give them a second chance? Well, Scripture does not bear that out on any level. It doesn't, we, we get second chances. I'm not saying it. But he doesn't come and preach to spirits imprisoned. Souls who passed out of life. We're told in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, as it relates to the gospel and our responsibility in life, it's appointed unto man what? Wants to die, and after that, a second chance. No, the judgment. The judgment. So, so, what was this? I believe what took place was a proclamation of the victory that he goes on to assert here in verse 22 through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been what? Subjected to him. See, in, in their mind, you've got to understand something. The demonic world and Satan are not omniscient. There, Satan is not God. He is not even a close second. I want you to understand that. Satan isn't even a close second to our God. He's created by our God. Our God is the God. Satan is minuscule. He doesn't possess the attributes of God. He is very powerful second to God, but a distant second. He's very powerful, but He doesn't compare to our God at all. And these fallen angels under Him, they don't have the omniscience of God. They don't understand all of this that took place. So as, 
as it related to the life of Christ and these things, although they have great knowledge, you have to understand something. Defilement defiles the mind as well. Walk away from God and watch how your own mind becomes more worldly in your thinking. More accepting of that which is an offense to God. You want to think like God? Walk with God. Commune with God. Feed on God's Word. When you get away from God, you start thinking that way. So they're thinking, this stuff still hung in the balance. Carmen wrote a song years and years ago. The this, this singer, you've heard of Carmen, haven't you? Who sang about the devil's rejoicing. All the way up to the cross, experience of passion, how Christ was abused, and they're glorying in it. And then there's the heartbeat of the, the, the three days. And then the tomb's empty. Then the realization. I believe what took place in this text was a proclamation of the victory over them. That it's done. It's settled. You'd say, well, man, I would think they'd know it. So would I. They're chained. And they're imprisoned. But, it, but they're not God. <coughs> See, Satan is going to work to over to thwart God's program right to the very end. Case in point, book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. He's still out because he's smart enough to know that Israel, there has to be a literal, genealogical, biologically Israel, Jew, to embrace the promises that God made. Otherwise, God is not God. And so after he's cast out of heaven in Revelation, when God finally lets Michael loose on him and says, get him out of here, and he's gone. He's out of there. He's no longer accusing. What's he do? When he comes down, he goes after the woman. Because he's out to destroy her. Hitler, what was that all about? Get rid of the Jews. Why? It was spiritual. Why do people hate the Jews so? It's spiritual. Get them out of there. If they're gone, God couldn't keep His word. What's that make God? He's not God. That's what it makes Him. He's just a powerful being. God has to be able to bring His will to pass. And He will. And He does. And this was a proclamation to those in prison who did that terrible thing in Genesis 6 that they lost. It's done. It's done. Third one, as it relates to this question, you said, man, you weren't going to do this. Well, I'm doing it. Third question, when did he do this? Did he do it while he was in the grave? Many believe he did. Actually, many, many people actually believe he went to hell and suffered in hell for three days. I believe he suffered hell as to what it means and that is a complete and total separation from the Father. And it happened on the cross of Calvary. And he said by his own words, it is what? It's finished. He didn't say I'm coming from the cross to go now to hell to embrace greater suffering therefore by paying for your sins. What did he do? He cried out a lie, a lie, lama sabachthani. Why? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt it right then. And then he said what? It's finished. And he commended his spirit. And it says in this verse down here, verse 18, look at the last part of the verse. Having been put to death in the flesh, but what? Made alive in the spirit. Made alive. Resurrection. So when did he go? He went right, right after the resurrection. There was a proclamation made of the victory of the cross. That what, what seemed like a victory to the, the demonic and the satanic was really the battle. The, 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 the victory was secured and he proclaims it to these imprisoned demons. That's what I believe. And I believe I have support for that. 
Now the co corresponding to that, the last one. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Question, does baptism save you? If you answer yes, wrong. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. It, 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 the clear passages of Scripture clearly teach that baptism doesn't save you. Now our Christian, the, the quote Christian church denomination, and many other churches for that matter, teach baptismal regeneration. That meaning, baptism is a requirement whereby you have to have that performed on you to be saved. You have to believe in Jesus. We qualify it. They'll qualify it. And they'll say, no, I believe exactly what you believe. You have to believe in Jesus, but you have you, you got to be baptized. And that's what makes this operative. you got to have the faith, but this makes it operative to the person. It's just like an act of faith. Well, problem with that is scriptures do not teach that. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Paul said, I praise God that I didn't baptize any of you to the Corinthians, save two, two individuals. Now let's, let's think about that. If he truly believed, or it was the, uh, the act, the rite of baptism saved, you would think Paul would have been looking to dunk everybody he could get his hands on. And he wasn't, because that's not what's here. Nor is it in this text as well, even though it says that statement. And, and then you got the one in Acts, you be baptized for the remission of sin. Well, that's a simple answer, because the, the conjunction for can be uh, translated because. It can be translated several ways. It's a matter of what in theology you're going to insert there. And you've got to stay consistent with the Scriptures. And the Scriptures say, believe, trust, trust, trust. That's what it says. That's the one thing. The one common. You have to do that. So, I don't believe it's baptism for salvation, so what's men here? Well, it seems to me what he's saying is, is just the way... Noah's time, they identified with the ark for their, their, their salvation. What they have to do is Jesus is the ark. He's the ark. And I, I'm using it as a metaphor. I'm just saying, He is the vessel of rescue. And you have to identify corresponding to what? What He just said about Noah being rescued. Corresponding to that, what baptism now saves you. What's baptism? Baptism is identification with, immersion with Christ. And look what he says in the next verse so that you, there's no confusion here. Not the next verse, but the next clause. <coughs> Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. What's he saying? He's saying not the right of baptism. Not going in water and coming out of water. But what's he say? But an appeal to God for a good conscience. What, why does he use good conscience? Because he just talked about it up there. He's talking about a right heart with God. It's an appeal to God for a right heart. <coughs> Salvation, if you will. For him to work the work of regeneration through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. He's alive. He, he's done this. The victory's in him. That's what it's saying. You don't, you don't have to derail here with this. And they'll try to derail you if you get in a discussion uh, with, with folks who are baptismal regeneration. They'll go right here. But he's talking about, as Mary Sutton put it years and years ago, he's talking about an outward testimony of an inward action. And Mary Sutton, most of you probably, some of you know her, but godly woman, loved the Lord. She was a mother to many of us here in a lot of ways. Uh, early in our faith, she went to our church, just the sweetest lady. She's, she's just, she was exceptional. Christian lady. We had a lot of them. And didn't we? We had a lot of good gals. But uh, we did, didn't we? But anyway, she always said that it's an outward testimony of an inward action. What's it saying? It happens here, and I follow through here. But that's not even what's here. What he's talking about is the, the immersion in Christ, embracing Christ, identifying with Christ as the vessel of rescue. That's what he's talking about. Now back to the real issue behind 
all this because you can get derailed there. I'm telling you, that's a powerful theological. Uh, I don't want to call it. A, it's a great passage, but it can be a bare, it can be a wasteland to you if you're not prepared going in because people you know they'll mess with you and you'll be like, oh, what what is it saying? Well, listen, always in hermeneutics, Bible interp. What's the rule? The clear over the obscure. And context, context, context. So let Scripture interpret Scripture because Scripture does not contradict. So if there's a problem, it's with my thinking. So i got to go to where there's clear statements, where there's no confusion, where anybody can look at it, and that's what it says. And then i got to place the difficult thing in the context and allow that to try and sort itself out. And more often than not, it will. It'll fix itself, and you'll be fine. Just a Bible study methods lesson for you there. But anyway, the issue here is the example. The third key is the example, the model of suffering. You want to look at somebody who suffered properly for righteousness' sake? Look at Jesus. Look at the one who loves you more than anybody, and who you and I love more than anybody. Look at your Lord. What's it say? He died for sins. The just for the unjust. To bring us to God. And through the suffering, He was ultimately exalted. Which brings us back to this. He came through it how? Blessed. As one privileged of God. Exalted by God. There's the blessing. There's the victory. Even the example of Christ proves out if I'll submit to the Lordship of Him, God, in my life, no matter what road it takes me on, I come through it the victor in Christ. If I'll implement these keys. That's our encouragement here. That's the big encouragement. All who suffer for righteousness sake are highly favored of God. Every one of you. If you've suffered for righteousness sake, you're favored of God. That's what, it, what we're told here. But we need to suffer in a manner that is in keeping with the privilege. Suffer in a way that speaks of the privilege you've been blessed with. And that, 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 that means we've got to go through this right. There's got to be a, a right way. Now you may say, I don't know if I can do that. I just don't know if I can do that. I, 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 and, I, and I'm going to tell you, I hear that all the time. From people, I don't know if I could ever face the martyr situation. I don't know if I could suffer this way, and and actually come through it as I should. Well, I want I want to share a little bitty story with you about a little boy who was shopping with his dad in the grocery store, and he's walking by his dad, and his dad just kept taking things off the shelf and putting them in his boy's arms, and they're just moving through, and the boy's getting more and more in his arms in the basket he's carrying. And he just keeps putting them in the basket. And the boy's moving through there. Finally, a lady said, how can you bear up to that load? And he, he said, let me help you. And he's like, oh, no, no, I can carry this. My father knows exactly how much I can carry. And guess what? So does ours. He knows exactly what you can bear. And if you're going through it and have you consider yourself privileged that you're able to suffer for righteousness sake. Suffer for your Lord. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you always for your truth, your word. And I pray, Lord, that by your spirit we might measure up in circumstances such as suffering and persecution. Help us, Lord, to implement these keys that surface out of this book of Peter. And I pray, Lord, that as we go through our life and we hit these times of suffering uh, unjustly, being persecuted for righteousness' sake, Lord, I pray that they'd see Jesus in each one here. Just help us, Lord, to make that the priority, to enshrine Christ as Lord in our hearts. Bless each one for being out this morning. I'd ask that you bless the day ahead of us club ministries tonight as always lord we ask that you'd use them to impact uh, these young lives 
for your glory. But just bless the fellowship we might enjoy one with another throughout this day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.